morning, everybody. Turn with me in your hymnals to number 15. We'll read this in unison. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through his prophets, that we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Ralph, would you open us with prayer this morning? Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather here this morning. We thank you for all the good gifts that you give. We thank you that we can love you and praise you and worship you this morning. We get together in this place, Lord, to, to give gifts back to you. We give our love to you, Lord. We thank you for everything that we have. We ask, this, we ask you to bless Tony's message this morning. Amen. 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 Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. We'll go back there after our diversion last week. I'm going to read verses 15 through 17. And I want to say something before we read that. God's word, the word of God is eternal. And in that capacity, or lack thereof, it is amazing because the things that it could bring to mind for one person are different than what it can speak to another person and another person and another person we hear what God wants us to hear when we yield ourselves to his word. And so in that light, uh, the focus and direction of where I'm going with this today may not be exactly, um, I'm not going to focus on the love of the world as such, but it will take a direction that coincides with speaking about the next section about Antichrist and the future of the church, considering the position of the church in the world in the latter times. So let's ask the Lord to bless that. Father, we yield our hearts and our minds to you right now and ask you to speak to us through your word and by your spirit. Lord, and then once that word has entered our hearts and in our minds, help us to yield to it and make it a part of who we are. In the name of Jesus, we thank you and we pray. Amen. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Or everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man or the cravings of the flesh, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. 
the world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. In order to gain the understanding that I'm seeking for us today, we need to go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Beginning at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And the first point that I want to make about this particular section of Scripture is that Satan must disguise who he is in order to deal with us. If we knew and saw him in the reality of who and what he is, we would run far and run fast. But he disguises himself in many different ways, one in particular being called an angel of light. In this particular case, he disguised himself as a unique creature in the garden, it says that he was more crafty than any of the other wild animals in the garden. And evidently, this is implicit, or maybe my interpretation, Eve was uh, interested in this guy that was in front of her. A snake that speaks? I wonder if any other animals spoke. But in any case, he hides behind something that he knows is appealing to us. And that's important to remember. Jesus referred to Satan as a liar, the father of all lies. That is his native tongue, Jesus said in John 8, 44. He said he is a murderer and has been from the beginning. He called him the evil one and he called him the prince of this world. That's the Lord Jesus speaking of Satan. The Apostles Paul and the Apostle John referred to him as the evil one. They referred to him as the God of this age. They referred him to him as the ruler of the world system in Ephesians 2.2, the spirit who is now at work in the children of disobedience. It's a powerful position to hold in this world. Yet that's who he is. And he's the leader of demonic, the demonic forces of evil from Ephesians chapter 6. The different names that are ascribed to him, define him, have the meaning of destroyer, adversary, and slanderer. That's what he is to us. That's what he seeks to accomplish in his relationship with the people of God. He hates God the Father. He hates God the Son. He despises the work of the Holy Spirit. And he hates all of God's people. In whatever form of relationship that takes, the church, he hates. He wants to destroy it. 
you and me, he wants to destroy us. Israel, he wants to wipe it off the face of the earth. And so he disguises himself as a servant, a serpent. And with his words, he sought to produce doubt in Eve's mind about God's truthfulness, about his character, and about the goodness of his heart. If you want to turn with me to 2 Corinthians, you can otherwise. Chapter 11. It gives us a little more insight into this. Paul is referring. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1. I hope you will put up with a little of my foolishness, Paul says, but you are already doing that. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. And here it is. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Eve was deceived. Eve was deceived in her mind. And Paul is saying, that he is concerned that they will be easily swayed by the serpent's cunning continuing on in their minds and be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He hasn't changed in all these years. It's still the same. Eve was deceived but in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, it tells us that Adam was not deceived. His was a willful act. The serpent deceived Eve through his words, through the questioning of God and God's word. But Adam made a willful act. And just a little side road about this particular thing. I feel strongly about this, that moment, for a couple of reasons. The wording in the Hebrew about where it says, and her husband, she gave some to her husband who was with her. That meant he was near, he was very close. There are a lot of different uh, uses of that particular small word in the Hebrew. But it meant that he was there when it happened. She didn't have to go look for him and say, hey, take a bite. No, he was there and he saw what happened. He kept his mouth shut. He neither affirmed or denied anything that was being said. He did not step in to do something for his wife in that moment. It was a willful act. And there's a book that I have had for many, many years. It's called Portraits of Christ in Genesis. And the author, whose name escapes me at this moment, I think it's M.R. Dahan, but said that this is one of the very first pictures of Christ in the Bible, when Adam took that and ate that fruit. And he, he says that Adam saw his wife had done wrong. He had watched it and done nothing. And he knew that it was all over. She was a part of him. If she died, he was going to die. And in order for him, in order for God to be able to provide a redeemer, they would have to bear children. And so he ate the apple so he could be like her. A little bit of a stretch, and it's definitely not written in the book. But it's a picture of Christ taking on flesh, becoming like us, so that he could redeem us. Adam became like his wife, 
so he could provide so God could provide a redeemer through that seed. <clears throat> but it's important to realize that Eve was deceived. In chapter 2 of Genesis, verses 16 through 17, I would like someone, I'm going to ask you to read what God said. Let's see. Who would like to read? Okay, verses 16 and 17. Emphasis on, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. That's a command. And it says, command. The Lord God commanded the man. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. You will surely die. In chapter 3, there's some revision going on here. And it's very important. First, Satan says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? No, he didn't say that. Adam, speak. Adam's silence is, is it damned all of us. Adam's silence. And there's a great book by... Dr. Larry Crabb called, and Adam was silent. It's intense. If you ever want to get into something and in understanding this stuff, it's, it's really good stuff. And um, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. God said, God said, you are free to eat. You can eat freely from any tree in the garden but one. That's what God said. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Pretty close. And you must not touch it. I'm sorry, Eve. That's not part of it. No. You're changing what God said. You must not touch it. And Robin, I think you have King James? No? Well, in King James and New American Standard, it says, you must not touch it lest you die. Lest, unless you die. Lest you die. It, it is not an emphatic term. It is a less strong term than surely you will die. And Satan jumps right on that weak phraseology, and he says, you will not surely die. God said you surely will die. He said, you will not surely die. There's one other thing that's hidden in this. In verse 1 of chapter 3, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Yahweh. Yahweh made it. The Lord God, creator, sustainer of all things in the universe. Verse 3. Excuse me. At the end of verse 1. Did God, Elohim, did he really say? Did Elohim really say? Did the divine being say? The Lord God is a person, is a being, is a person. The Lord God and Elohim is a divine being. It is a lesser, a lesser term. 
And they both, Eve and Satan, can continue using Elohim. When Eve refers to what God said, she refers, Elohim said this, and Elohim said that. And in verse 5, For Elohim knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like Yellowhims, plural. You will be like gods, with a small g. Because you know good and evil. And so what we have here is we have a situation where Eve has taken from God's word, taking something out of what God said, omitting it freely, omitting the word freely from the first part, eat freely from the fruit from the trees in the garden. She added to it, she added the words, don't touch it. And she changed it from surely you will die to lest you die. The thing that I think is important for us to understand here is this. Personal receipt of the word of God is very important. God gave the word to Adam. Adam spoke it to Eve. Okay? She was created after the command. So Adam gave the word to Eve. And I had a strange thing one time, many years ago. There was a kid that I worked with who was a Christian. And he, um, he was going to to a church over in Uxbridge that's had some rough history um, down in the industrial park down there. And, and he, uh, their testimony is not pure, if that's a good way to put it. And he, his wife said something, we were at a, a Christmas party or something like that, and he, there was something that came up about salvation and he turned to his wife and he looked at her and he says, we're okay, right? And I went, you're a Christian, right? In my mind, you're a Christian and you have to ask your wife if you're okay? Knowing God's promises, knowing who and what you are in Christ and what God has provided for you in Christ needs to come to you directly from the Word of God. If you just come here on Sunday and listen to me for however long and get what I give and take it home and that's what your food is for the rest of the week, you're missing out and you're going to make yourself vulnerable. If you're just listening to this preacher or that preacher on the radio or on TV, that should be there to edify the faith that you have that you receive directly from God himself by his spirit through his word and you need to continually replenish that and rebuild that. It's going to be between you and God when it's all said and done. And so I think that there's something just to, uh, this ain't no doctrinal thing, this is just something that I'm saying is Eve received the word from Adam and look what happened to it. It got distorted. God had a plan. And I don't question that. And at that moment in the garden when the two of them their eyes were opened, and they realized they were naked. That was the beginning of self. That was the beginning of self. In that mindset, Eve saw that the fruit was good. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, verse 6, she took some and ate it. Oh, excuse me. And also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The first thing that 
happens here is that the woman saw the fruit and she recognized that it was good for food. And so that was the first step. Now, if we go back to 1 John, you'll see where I'm going with this. The three things that John brings up in chapter 2 started here in the garden. Verse 16, for everything in the world, and that world, when John refers to world here, he's talking about the world system of things, how the world works, the world's operating. He's not talking about for God so loved the world, all the people of the world. He's not talking about terra firma. He's not talking about the earth, that world. He's talking about the world system, the cravings of sinful man. The lust of the flesh is the way it's translated in other versions. Everything in the world. When the woman saw that the fruit was good for food, the cravings of the flesh, she saw that it was appealing to her body and she wanted to eat it. And pleasing to the eye, it looked good. Verse John, verse 16. The lust of his eyes, and finally the boasting of what he has and does, the pride of life, if you will, to rephrase it, comes not from the Father, but from the system of the world that started right there in the garden when Eve was deceived, when she did not adhere to the, to the word of God, the actual command of God, but she reinterpreted it, added to it, took something away from it, she ate, she yielded to those things that God had created in her that were good, but they were bad in disobedience to the command that God had given. And her husband took and ate also. And thus began the system of the world, the basic principles that which the world lives by, that John is addressing here in 1 John chapter 2. The cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does. She saw that it was good for wisdom. And we could be like gods. We can be like gods. And as you look at the way things are in this world, You've got to recognize and understand that this is the origin of it all. And the system of the world produces, provides and produces nothing eternal. There are lots of things in this world that we like, enjoy, even love. I love baseball. I love hockey. I love the Patriots. But I don't agape them. I enjoy what they, what they do. And you know, this is, may seem stupid, but Frank Reich, he was the offensive coordinator for the Philadelphia Eagles. He is also formerly known for being the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills, and he, in a backup role, led the Buffalo Bills to the greatest comeback in NFL history. I think it was 38 to three and they won 41 to 38 or something like that. And all the while he's singing a hymn in his heart and, and reciting, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And this year he finds himself at the Super Bowl and there are other Christian, real Christian people vocal about their faith on that team. They win the Super Bowl. He's now the head coach of the, of the Indianapolis Colts, thanks to Josh. But you know, God honor, has honored him, I believe, in his life. And I think that Christ is more important to him and his relationship with Christ. What was that thing that Tebow said? It's not... Bill's been watching this thing. He's really hyped up about it on uh, Right Now Media. It's, uh, it's, it's like him presenting his book or the, the essence of his book, right? And um, 
So there are things in this world that we're going to enjoy doing and like doing. In fact, you know, it's a good thing that God gives us work to do and he gives, he blesses our businesses. He blesses the efforts of our hands. He provides the increase. He provides the, the prosperity. Um, but when the attitude changes from, I can do this, you know, this is what I have. I boast of these things in my life. I, I am on top of the world because of my efforts. That, that uh, what's the word? That, that just that selfishness, that I. That's dangerous. That's what he's talking about here. And he's saying that the world system of things is designed to just draw us into that. Just like the deception in the garden ruined mankind's future. Made it necessary for Christ to die. Be careful of that, he's saying. Because the love of the Father is not in the person who loves the world or anything in the world. The love of the Father. The love of the Father is selfless. Self began in the, Bible, in the, in the garden at that moment. And selflessness is, resides in the eternal Father God. And Jesus was the manifestation of who God the Father is in the flesh. He did nothing for himself. What he did, he did for everyone else. He did for you and for me and for the whole world. Selflessness. That is the love of the Father. And indulging in these things and loving, to, loving them to the point of needing them, prospering in them, Wanting them more than anything else takes the love of the Father and it, it just eradicates it in our hearts. We should crave that love of the Father so that we would not be drawn to love the world because our enemy is always seeking to deceive us. He's now described in the New Testament as a roaring, roaring lion prowling around looking for who he might, desire, might devour. But his time is near the end. And that's why we're going to go on and talk about the warning against antichrists. Because this was 2,000 years ago almost that John wrote this letter. And the antichrists were already out there. And so it's important he's giving this warning before he talks about the Antichrist, because the, the plan of the devil, his motives operandi has never changed. He is always trying to deceive us, always trying to bring God's character, truthfulness, and promises into question. And it's important that you seek those out yourself so that you're not just getting it secondhand. You need to know what this book says to you. Let the Spirit take the word and soak it into your heart. This week I, had to, I prayed a lot about being washed by the water of the word. I need my soul washed by the water of the word. And I need to do that not just daily, but three or four times a day. I need to ask the Lord to do that so that my heart would be cleansed. David said, create in me a clean heart. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and and for your graciousness. And I pray, Lord God, that you would reveal to us those areas in our hearts where we need to release things of this world and confess to you that we have placed things of this world above our relationship with you and not acknowledged who it is and what, you, what it is that you are and you give to us. And Lord, I pray that you would bless each one here who brings that to you faithfully and seeks to have your hand move upon them. Lord, be gracious to us, sinful people. Thank you for your word. Cleanse our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.